Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to worship with us today. Today we will be baptizing young Slayton Stone Fields into God's family. And uh, so we are glad to see that the, the church is growing. Uh, we uh, are not going to do a whole lot uh, in terms of this week, except that uh, the men's and the gals groups will be meeting next Saturday. Uh, I'm going to be uh, kind of, uh, got a lot of stuff going on. I've got uh, a two four-hour Zoom blocks uh, set up uh, in a meeting with the uh, uh, LCMS uh, secretary. Uh, it's an orientation for all district secretaries, and that's on Wednesday the 7th and Thursday, the morning of Thursday the 8th. And then right after that, head down to Slidell for the uh, district board of directors meeting. So I'll be gone from the 8th to the 10th. So, uh, you know, if you need any pastoral uh, assistance from Wednesday through Saturday of this week, uh, please give Pastor Bernanke uh, a call at uh, our Redeemer. Uh, otherwise, today we will be focusing on baptism. That's the, uh, the big theme of the service, and of course that will be the focus of the sermon. And the, uh, the hymns, of course, not only do they relate to the scripture readings on the back, but in many ways it also uh, relate to the, the theme of holy baptism. And uh, so, uh, as we welcome our uh, guests and visitors today, we begin with the opening hymn, As Surely As I Live, God Said.
203 in the four part of the hymnal as we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? O few, there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise. Let him first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God has given his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die for each and every one of you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of that same Christ and by his authority. I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land 
that you are going over to the Jordan to enter and possess, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Philemon, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brothers, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet, for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Please rise as we sing together the Alleluia in verse. Thank <laughs> desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first 
and deliberate whether he is able to, with 10,000, to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Now continue with the baptismal hymn, baptized in your name, most holy. Please be seated. Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever 
unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the world, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How is the child to be named? Satan Stone Fields. Slate and Stone. Receive the sign of the cross upon your forehead and upon your heart as a sign of one redeemed in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, according to your own judgment, you condemned the unbelieving world through the flood. Yet according to your great mercy, you preserved believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea. Yet you led your people Israel through the water on dry ground, foreshadowing this washing of your holy baptism. Through the baptism in the Jordan of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold Slayton according to your boundless mercy and bless him with true faith by the Holy Spirit that through this saving flood all sin in him, which has been inherited from Adam and which he himself has committed since would be drowned and die. Grant that he be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, being separated from the multitude of unbelievers and serving your name at all times with a fervent spirit and a joyful hope, so that with all believers in your promise, he would be declared worthy of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. to uh, answer in place of the sponsors who couldn't be here today, but I'm sure who are here in spirit and will be watching the video at some point in time. From ancient times, the church has observed the custom of appointing sponsors for baptismal candidates and catechumens. In the Evangelical Lutheran Church, sponsors are to confess the faith expressed in the Apostles' Creed and taught in the small catechism. They are wherever possible, to witness the baptism of those they sponsor. They are to pray for them, support them in their ongoing instruction and nurture in the Christian faith, and encourage them toward faithful reception of the Lord's Supper. They are at all times to be examples to them, the holy life of faith in Christ and love for one's neighbor. So on behalf of the sponsors, I ask, is it your intention to serve Slayton as sponsors in the Christian faith? If so, answer, yes, with the help of God. Yes, yes with the help of God. God enable you both to will and do this faithful and loving work, and with his grace, fulfill what we are unable to do. Amen. Here the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. They brought young children to Jesus that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands on them, and he blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord preserve your coming in and going out from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Okay, now it's your turn. And you can answer for Slayton and there'll maybe come a day when he can answer for himself. Slayton, do you renounce the devil? If so, answer, yes, I renounce him. 
Do you renounce all his works? If so, answer, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? If so, answer, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? If so, answer, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. If so, answer yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? If so, answer yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Slayton, do you desire to be baptized? If so, answer, yes, I do. Yes, yes. I do. Okay. Over here. Yeah. Slayton, stone fields, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. All right, well, we had failure on the candle, but it's good. Anyway, we receive this uh, candle as a uh, remembrance of your baptism, and, and you know it can be used kind of as a baptismal birthday celebration to remind you that you have been forgiven and made one of Christ's own family through his blood and through the washing of the Holy Spirit. In holy baptism, God the Father has made you, Slayton, a member of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir with us, with all the treasures of heaven. In one holy Christian and apostolic church, we receive you in Jesus' name as our brother in Christ, that together we might hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you graciously preserve and enlarge your family and have granted Slayton the new birth and holy baptism and made him a member of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We humbly implore you that as he has now become your child, you would keep him in his baptismal grace that according to your good pleasure, he may faithfully grow to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of your holy name. And finally, with all your saints, obtain the promised inheritance in heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord and giver of life, look with kindness upon the father and mother of this child and upon all our parents. Let them ever rejoice in the gift you have given them. Enable them to be teachers and examples of righteousness for their children. Strengthen them in their own baptism and that they may share eternally with their children the salvation you have given them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, since you govern and sanctify the whole Christian church by your Holy Spirit, hear our prayers for all her members and mercifully grant that by your grace we may serve you in true faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. You can return your seats.
Now at this time, since we have just witnessed a baptism, it is appropriate that we use the ancient baptismal creed of the church, the Apostles' Creed, creed found on page 207. We confess this creed, the Christian faith, together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, why did Slayton get wet today? And what's up with the water? Well, we first have to ask what baptism is all about. And instead of looking at any particular denominational statement or what have you, it would be appropriate to see what Scripture itself has to say. What is baptism all about? Well, it's a washing. It's that simple. It is a washing. Our English Bibles often make a strong difference between washing on the one hand and baptizing on the other. However, if you look in Greek, whether it's the Greek version of the Old Testament, which is one of the first versions of the Old Testament to be translated from Hebrew and Aramaic into another language, uh, as well as then the Greek New Testament thereafter, Greek is pretty good at interchanging the words luo and baptizo, which both mean to wash. So we really have to look at the context to find out the meaning of what is going on. See, there's a broad use of the term, which basically means to clean your body, to clean uh, your clothes, and to clean vessels and other things that you use that need to be cleaned. So it's just regular washing. However, there are certain contexts that make the words for washing special in Scripture. So, for example, we have an act of love and hospitality in Genesis and Samuel, as well as uh, John 13, that is the washing of one's feet. It is a kind of homecoming in a way. You go to a person's house and they wash your feet as a way of saying, welcome, welcome, be at ease, be at home, wash those dirty feet. After all, people used to wear Bible shoes, or as we call them today, Crocs or something, you know, and, uh, or just flip-flops or whatever, you know, and sandals. And, uh, um, you, you know, there's a lot of dust on the road. Animals did their stuff on the road. Your feet got pretty dirty on the road. And so washing your feet kind of took all that mess and made it go away. And it gave you a whole new introduction to being in a a lived-in uh, space, a homely place. And it's where the master of the house uh, often uh, washed the feet of his guests as a sign of respect toward those whom he invited in. Or in the case of Samuel, it was David trying to get rid of Uriah and have an excuse for him being the father of David's illegitimate child. But uh, the thing is, it's still, it's this loving act. And uh, when Jesus does it with his disciples, he shows them how much he loves them and also shows us how much he loves us. It is a foreshadowing, of course, of what he will do on the cross. Uh, then washing also has the context of making something ceremonially clean, preserving the boundaries of the holy the clean and the unclean, removing impurity, restoring being clean, being healthy, holy, being healthy, etc. 
uh, and using the word of God along with the water to do it. We see that in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Psalm 73, and Isaiah 4, verse 4. The word of the priest goes along with the washing to have somebody or something declared ceremonially clean. Uh, now, in keeping with that theme of Exodus, the Red Sea Exodus is described as a baptism or a washing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we see all over the Bible that God acts in the washing where he intends something to be purified. The water in the word healed disease, 2 Kings 5, for example, with Elisha and Naaman the Syrian, uh, he is healed in the Jordan River by water. And he's like, wait, the Jordan River is this crummy river. We got better rivers in, in uh, Assyria, so why should I bathe here? And his servant said, well, why not? You know, the prophet gave his word, and his word went along with the water and made Naaman clean again. And we said, uh, see that also in John 9 with Jesus and the person healed in the pool of Siloam. We also see that the Lord washes away sin in Psalms 26 and 51. Baptism also washes away sin, Acts 22, verse 16. Human washing does not work. It needs God's command to go with it. We see that in Jeremiah, when Jeremiah is chiding the people of Israel, saying, you know, if you just do your ceremonial washings and you do not, respond with also repentance and a desire to follow what God has commanded, things will not go well. Baptism is not magic. It doesn't happen autopilot. And we see the same thing when Jesus talks about the ceremonies of the Pharisees in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And our, our scripture readings allude to that. They are not talking to people who are not Christians. They are not saying, start off by making your own faith from unbelief into belief. You cannot tell a dead person to live. You cannot tell an unbeliever to have faith. God has to do that. But you can tell one, someone who is alive, don't do something that gets you hurt. Right? And that's essentially what our readings today were talking about. When it talks about following God's commandments in order to have life, it's saying you who have been given life, now don't hurt yourself. And Isaiah 1 verse 6 says, wash yourselves. It seems that if Isaiah was saying, you've got to do it yourself, but the context there is the sacrificial system and the means for atonement. Again, whatever we're doing, God is the major actor, and we are simply following along in his wake, so to speak. So then we also have cases in the New Testament where washing is special. We have John's Baptism, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have references to this. Uh, John the Baptist's washing is for repentance and forgiveness. And we see that again in Acts 8 and 19, the Holy Spirit is added to this uh, baptism that John did in order to segue into Trinitarian baptism. Those who did not have Trinitarian baptism in uh, and yet knew of the teaching of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, did not have to be rebaptized. Those who did not have that teaching did get rebaptized. And from uh, those scripture passages, we have the, the understanding that we only need to baptize once in the triune name, and that's good enough. We also have the use, oddly enough, of Jesus washing people with fire. References to the final judgment, both in Matthew and Luke. John the Baptist said he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The fire with which he will baptize is the fire on judgment day. You do not want to be washed with fire. You want to be washed with water and the Spirit. So then we have the messianic and apostolic anointments that are washings in Scripture. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, Jesus is baptized as the Messiah with the Father's word and the Holy Spirit appearing as a dove. In Acts 1, the Holy Spirit's fire anoints the apostles into their office after they received Jesus' breath in John chapter 20. 
So both Jesus' breath and the tongues of fire of the Holy Spirit are the things that make the apostles the apostles. But then we have Trinitarian baptism, and that's fairly common throughout the New Testament. And so Matthew 28, 16 through 20, is the big deal. Jesus mandates Trinitarian baptism and teaching scripture based on Jesus' authority. And that is essential for faith, for the church, and for Christian mission. And uh, we see other references to uh, kind of tangential references to baptism in this fashion in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Then in Acts 2, uh, the Pentecost church is born of two things. It's born of the preaching that uh, the Holy Spirit assisted uh, on Pentecost, but it's also born out of Christian baptism because those who were preached to then were baptized. Then uh, in Acts 9, we see that Paul was baptized, and yet he is an apostle just as much as the other apostles. So therefore, we know that the baptism that Paul received also delivered the Holy Spirit, which is necessary for being an apostle. And uh, Acts 16 and 1 Corinthians 1 tell us that entire households were baptized. There is no distinction of age or even will made. If the head of the house said, I want my whole family baptized, the whole family got baptized, whether they liked it or not, because the head of the family's word was law in the household back in the ancient times. So that means we don't have to decide first whether we want to be baptized or not, just like we don't get to decide whether or not we want to be born or not. It just kind of happens. What happens, though, is that it becomes a part of our life thereafter, and the teaching that goes along with baptism is the thing that keeps us from doing the spiritual equivalent of playing on the interstate. Uh, then by Acts 18 and 19, we see that baptism is pretty standard practice. It was very early on that baptism was the thing that the church did to catechize people, whether, whether it was after preaching one sermon at Pentecost or whether it was before a period of instruction. Uh, even in Acts 8, you see just a little bit of instruction, and then they say, like, this sounds good, I want to do it, let's, let's do the baptism. So, and we have then this one special thing this one special kind of washing in Scripture that we see in very few places outside of Revelation except for the sacrifices, which is the washing in blood. Normally, blood makes you unclean, but there is a washing in blood that makes you clean, and that is the washing in Jesus' blood. It is a special kind of washing. It, the only other blood that makes you clean like that is the blood of the sacrifices that we see again in, for example, Exodus and elsewhere, where the blood is sprinkled on the people. And then Isaiah 53 says that Christ will sprinkle the nations with his blood. And we see in Revelation 22, 14, that this washing in the blood of the Lamb uh, gives eternal life. So Revelation 7.14 and 22.14 both seal this baptism as a means of grace unto eternal life. Now, of course, the most important use of baptism in Scripture refers to death, specifically the death of Christ and how it pertains to our death. Uh, Mark chapter uh, 10, verses 38 and 39, Luke 12, verse 50 and are the, the, the two passages where Jesus refers to his death, his suffering and death, literally his outpouring of blood for us as his baptism. Romans chapter three, uh, chapter six, verses three and four, Colossians chapter two, verse twelve, they both say that Christians are buried into the death of Christ. As Christ suffered, died, and was buried, so are baptisms bury us together with him, that as he rose, we might rise. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 says that Christians are baptized into Christ's body. We are made literally a part of him. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, and Galatians 3, verse 27 say that Christ's body is alive and it is risen 
and Christians who are baptized into the Christian life and faith are also part of that body they put on Christ. They literally wear Christ. Christ's body is a part of their body. First Peter verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 21 says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, that is God's rescue of Noah, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why our English Bibles do make this difference between washing words and baptism words. Mark uh, chapter 16, verse 16 says, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And Titus 3, verse 5 says, He saved us, that is, Christ saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now, Martin Luther does us a big favor of summarizing all of these scripture passages in the small catechism. Baptism is not simply water only, but it is the water comprehended in God's command and connected with God's word. Baptism works forgiveness of sins, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this. As the words of our promises of God declare, it is not the water indeed that does them, but the word of God, which is in and with the water, and faith, which trusts such word of God in the water. For without the word of God, the water is simple water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism, that is a gracious water of life, and a washing of regeneration in the Holy Spirit. Baptizing with water signifies that the old Adam in us should, by daily contrition and repentance, be drowned and die with all sins and evil lusts. And again, a new man daily come forth and arise, who shall live before God in righteousness and purity forever. So what does this mean to Slayton, to the Fields clan, and to all of us. Well, you know, John and Linda, you're the great-grandparents, and if things go the way they usually go with a lot of great-grandparents, you have about a one in four chance of seeing little Slayton reach adulthood. And there's going to be something that ties you together with him a lot stronger than the family ties you have. And that is the fact that you have in common with one another a baptism that doesn't last for a few years or a decade and a half or so. It lasts for eternity. So therefore, you will not simply have a brief period of time in which to get to know and watch this young boy grow and bloom into an interesting individual beloved of you, of course, but you will have an entire eternity to share with one another in faith. Thanks be to God. And, of course, you know, Tanner and Destiny, you, as parents, have to fend for and take care of this child in a rough and tumble world. When things were your grandparents' age, it was easy. 60 to 80 percent of all Americans were churched. Now less than 20% will be churched in your generation. About 18 right now, and it's still full. And we see our world kind of going to hell in a handcart. We see the fact that parental rights are in the process of being taken away in Canada. And people are putting very anti-biblical and strange ideas into young kids these days, even in our country. Well, let's just say that what they teach in school these days ain't what they taught when I went to school. And so, as we see the world get crazier around us, we need something that is an anchor. We need something that is going to keep us sane amid this, this craziness, this, uh, this hurricane of bad ideas that is tossing the church about like Noah's Ark in the storm. 
But you know what? God got Noah and his family through the storm, through the flood, and he brought them to dry land. You can be sure that through this baptism, the Holy Spirit will do the same. It is the anchor. It is the focal point. You keep with the scriptures, and you will be safe. You won't have to worry about all the shenanigans that go on in life, with the corporations and the politicians and all this other insanity and you know all this wokeism and you know yada yada that stuff is a fad it's only going to be around for a short time because this world will rolled up like a scroll one of these days when the lord comes back all this stuff that seems so powerful and permanent will be burned away you need that anchor you need God's family, you need the church because that's going to keep you safe. That's going to keep you sane. And that will get you through what is going to be a roller coaster ride of life over the next few years. Being a parent is tough. Growing up in a crazy world is tough. Being a grandparent has its own blessings, but it, it also has its own challenges. And all I can say is, with God, with the family of believers around you, a crowd of witnesses who got your back, you'd be better off for it. It means a lot. You know, you got to witness what is likely the greatest event in this young man's life happen today because the Holy Spirit came down and made him an everlasting son of God our heavenly. And the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep you strong and safe and give you that eternal peace that only, only we can uh, know as Christians, both now and until we all stand before his throne of grace, thanks to our baptism. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God and uh, for all according to their needs. Lord, we ask you to be with all who are going to be undergoing surgery and uh, who are undergoing care to see what might be up with them and uh, getting the proper diagnostic care that they need. We ask you to be with all who are struggling with uh, pain, who are recovering uh, from uh, ill health or are recovering from uh, procedures who are struggling with various conditions, including disease, cancer, uh, dementia, who are living in assisted living facilities, who are dealing with chronic pain, who are uh, struggling with uh, acute injury, and uh, who are just dealing with uh, various complicated situations in life, and who are struggling with end-of-life uh, issues, and who are in general going through a lot and need your care. Lord, we ask you to send them your Holy Spirit. If it be your will, completely heal them as you might desire. And if not, be their anchor. Help them know that they are your everlasting children, that these conditions are not permanent. There will come a day when all of this will be wiped away. And what they will know is peace and joy. We ask you to give them that strength to get them through the tough times so that they might uh, be fully healed and comforted by your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. In your we ask you to be with all who are in need of your divine guidance and protection, those who are trying to make sense of their lives after tragic losses, our military, our first responders, our medical caregivers, those family members who will watch their loved ones be put in harm's way. Those in authority, in, in government, those who are traveling, those who uh, are uh, uh, now going through their, their college classes and, and their schooling. We ask you to be with all who are in need of your divine guidance, your divine protection, that you might uh, look after them and keep them safe and help them uh, through whatever activities they might have to do. Lord, in your mercy. These and all other prayers, Lord, we offer them before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy.
Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. This time we'll collect the offer. Please rise as we sing together the offertory. Unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee his peace. Amen. 